All right, uh, welcome back. Let's start as usual with what you remember from the last lecture. Talked about a lot of things in a very short period of time. Testing, monitoring, DevOps, right? Anything specific that you remember? Yeah, so uh, I think for test mo monitoring, we discussed one, it's called chaos testing. Yeah, I think that's for production setting. Mm -hmm. Testing and production with chaos engineering, yeah. Um, yeah. Right, anybody else? Anything you remember or anything that stuck with you? Activity on tests. Can you just expand on this? Uh, this was the paper, I think. So there were different types of uh, tests for data infrastructure model, and there were like seven, seven to ten points for each. Right. So, so the one of the key points that I wanted to bring across, which was also in this um, the ML test score paper, is that you really want to test the entire infrastructure, right? So we're doing a lot of steps: data cleaning preparation, getting the data, training, modeling, serving, and so on. And you can um, test essentially every step in there. And it's actually qu can be quite problematic if you have mistakes in there, silent mistakes or other mistakes. So all the classic software engineering testing is appropriate in this context. Right, and then we talked a little bit about uh, machine learning operations, ML ops and DevOps kind of, uh, that there's tons of tools to automate deployment, auto automate reasoning and so on. Right. All right. Um, so as I said last time, I wanna pivot a little bit and talk more about a bunch of qualities that are particularly relevant in kind of systems with machine learning components. and. Today, I wanna to start talking about ethics and fairness. Um, today, potentially, is a somewhat depressing lecture because we're kind of talking about lots of problems. We probably won't get to solutions today. Um, but I wanna to talk about the kind of problems that um, you probably wanna be aware of, how to think about some of them, where some of them are coming from. And then I think next lecture, we're focusing on some of the machine learning mitigation strategies, kind of how people define fairness, how they measure fairness, but then also come back to the system level and think about mitigations at the system level, things that we as software engineers or requirements engineers uh, can do and how to be involved. This is also a fairly sensitive and difficult topic to, to talk about. So we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, I have lots of things and I'm happy to, to discuss all of them. Um, there are a bunch of interrelated topics and they are sometimes hard to separate. Um, so there's ethics, there's fairness, justice, discrimination, but then we're also leading into safety and privacy and security and transparency and accountability. And you could separate them all and you could focus probably on every single one on the, of them um, but they kind of bleed into each other. So I'm gonna start with kind of a more broad motivation. Um, and then we're focusing more specific on issues around fairness and discrimination. Um, but we're, we're kind of starting broadly. Um, I wanna start with this distinction of what's ethical and what's legal. Does somebody, can somebody just on the spot separate those two? How would you define ethical? How would you define legal? So I think legal would be, um, does it violate the law or not? And ethical might be something more cultural, societal, more of a personal belief than something that's explicitly coded somewhere. Right, um, so ethics is kind of this branch of philosophy that's the, kind, the science of standard human conduct. Um, it's a bit hard to define this. So, so there's no, no legal binding no enforcement beyond kind of shaming somebody. And then it depends a little bit on how much people can be shamed, right? There are certain people who are just resistant to shame and might not care about this. Um, 
it's kind of a societal agreement among multiple people of what's good standards, what's moral uh, potentially, right? So moral is, morality is usually a more personal setting and ethics is kind of the morality of groups, if you want, uh, kind of codifying something. Uh, professional ethics are a bit more specialized. So these are things where professional societies essentially codify a code of conduct, uh, certain rules of this is what we are expecting. Um, as software engineers, there are certain kind of rules, but they're not, we, we don't swear an oath as some physicians might do. Um, in Canada, there's some, some more kind of an engineering oath. Um, this, but these are usually kind of considered best practice or agreed standards or things that we expect from people most of the time. So a classic case study on the difference here is, um, so if you search just about the difference between ethics and morality, this will come up again and again. This is um, the CEO of a pharma company that raised, that bought a, a, a drug and then raised its price by, yeah, from 13 to $750 per pill, right? So this is perfectly legal. There's no, no law, at least at the time, I think still not today, against this, but this caused a big outcry, right? So most people would agree that this is not the behavior that, we'll, that we want to see in our society, right? People try to shame him. He was shame resistant. Um, he actually uh, got sued and is in jail now for other purposes um, that's unrelated to this. So this was perfectly legal, right? And from his perspective, he would also said, yeah, he made profits for his shareholders and this is his primary duty. Right? So there's usually a way that you can justify also unethical behavior, um, but it's not broadly accepted, right? And it's uh, probably something that we as engineers should be careful about and think about and probably not engage in. And the problem here is that as software engineers, we are in a very powerful position. With a few lines of code, we can cause significant damage. And there are lots of examples and there are more harmful examples and less harmful examples. Right? So there are lots of examples where with a single configuration mistakes, um, people lost banks a huge amount of money. They deployed the wrong version and they lost millions in like 10 seconds, right? And bankrupt the company. Um, there are lots of examples where with code we have severe health consequences, safety issues, right? Uh, up to the point that we're radiating and killing people or kind of uh, spacecrafts explode and things like this. But there are also things that seem kind of harmless. Like it seems really easy. Uh, and actually for this course, it's, it's really easy to just grab a huge amount of headlines. Um, it's so easy to find kind of controversial examples of bad practices. So this was two years ago um, that uh, some European airlines, um, some discount airlines uh, started when they assigned seats just to split up families to encourage them to buy seat tickets together, right? So to actually pay for the seats that they can sit together. There's even a component that this might be illegal in in, in when some of these passengers were children, but most of the time this is what we've, it's not illegal, but it's kind of unethical behavior probably as most of us would consider this. But it's a few lines of code that somebody wrote, right? Uh, and there's some engineer who was either thinking of the idea or was told to implement it and implemented this. Um, and there's always the question, how far are you comfortable with doing this? What do you consider still as ethical behavior? Um, where do you draw the line? And I like this example as kind of a example to show that this is really not always obvious. Um, this, is a, this is now a little bit dated. This is a couple of years ago that uh, Google released this doodle um, on the birthday of um, Paul, that's Paul, um, designer of some guitar. Um, and essentially, so you could go on the, Oops, on the web page and play 
kind of on the strings virtually and people recorded music with this, right? And there's an argument that they, they were celebrating their success, but there's an argument here that somebody with a few lines of code wasted millions of hours of productivity of people worldwide. Right, so you see here in just 48 hours, you recorded 5.1 years worth of music. So it has certainly had a tremendous impact. And you can think about, should the developer have some responsibility here? You can also say maybe with this thing, they spread a lot of joy and this was a net positive for humankind, um, right? But it's kind of, it's really easy to make some of those decisions to implement something without thinking about consequences, without thinking about kind of um, how does this affect other people? Is this something that we want as society? Um, and so on. Make sense? All right. So machine learning brings a lot of concerns and I think a lot of them are fairly broadly discussed and known. Uh, can you just bring up a couple of examples that you're familiar with kind of issues with machine learning, concerns, um, fairness issues, safety issues, um, dangers, risks? the personal level or societal level? I think one could be the example we've used in class a couple of times for some way, some automated system to decide admittance to a university or a similar thing to decide jobs. Because mm -hmm. uh, like the data you're training on is, is old and, you know, operating in a biased world. So if previous admittances were biased in some way, you're not solving that problem. We're gonna talk about this, but machine learning is a great way of codifying existing biases, right, in an algorithm. And then as Cijan writes, the lack of transparency kind of makes this even worse because there's a bias somewhere baked into an algorithm, but it might be very hard to figure out what, that, that it's there, where it's coming from, and so on. Other examples that you can think of? Kind of fairness issues in machine learning. There were a couple of things in the readings, I think. Um, right, credit scoring, um, where you might provide different credit limits to different populations. So I have a ton of these. Um, and we don't need to talk about all of them, but you can start with the very basic safety assumptions issues, right? So again, robot uprising, maybe not our primary concern right now, even though some people discuss this, but there are lots of things where with simple implementation decisions, we can have safety implications. And we'll talk about safety more later. Here's an example of a company doing kind of smart devices and uh, home automation um, systems to control heating and HVAC systems, when the servers are down, uh, people are complaining that they're freezing at home, right? So what's our ethical responsibility to kind of provide these systems and what happens if some of these things are machine learning components for operations and they may fail for things that we don't know. Um, another safety case, um, this happened essentially last semester when I, or last fall when I taught this lecture here in Pittsburgh, um, have you seen these robots running around the city? Um, there was a case um, which kind of blew up also on social media where uh, the robot was blocking in somebody in a wheelchair on a crosswalk, right? So the robot was in a position like this at the, at the lower curb and somebody was crossing the street but couldn't get up the curb because the robot was blocking the street and they obviously couldn't go around it. And this is kind of a, a dangerous situation that's there's kind of a question of how much should we have anticipated this right so they they blamed it on a faulty map and they fixed it after pulling the robots from the street for a while and there was a lot of press coverage um, but again we need to assume that there are certain assumptions and there are certain assumptions here that you might think it's maybe not so bad if the robot is standing there most people can just walk around right but certainly not everybody can <clears throat> 
you can go in different directions. Um, so in terms of addiction and mental health, there's a lot of issues here. Um, so let's assume I'm just want to look at power washing videos or so on Reddit, right? Um, Reddit has this mechanism to draw you in uh, that's also used by most kind of social media apps and so on, which is called the infinite scroll, right? So you go down and down and down and there's more and more topics. Um, the inventor of this pattern, I think worked at Google at the time, is regrets the invention at this point um, quite a bit. There's a psychological problem with the infinite scroll that there is no breaking point. So it kind of draws you in. You can just continue and continue and continue looking at things. Whereas previously with pagination, you would look at like 10 entries and then you need to make an active decision to jump to the next page. Right, so we're actually really good at building addictive apps. We're designing systems, often we're uh, optimizing recommendation algorithms and things like this, machine learning algorithms to increase engagement, right? To, to draw users in, to have them spend as much time on our site as possible, have them watch as many YouTube videos as possible, have them look at how, because this correlates to ad revenue often, right? So we actually have been pretty good at designing systems in a way, designing recommendation engines and user experience to draw people in and keep them engaged, which can lead to addiction. There's lots of discussions around this. Um, Robin Hood, an app for trading has been in the news because they have extremely gamified their interface. Um, you kind of are drawn in into gaming or uh, into, into trading. Um, you get badges for trading and your first uh, increases, right? So it, it kind of attracts people who don't necessarily know what they're doing very well and kind of get into this and kind of get addicted to this. And there's a lot of kind of, again, machine learning behind it to guide you in the way to give you the feedback at the point, get you the, the endorphine hit at the point when, when it actually keeps you engaged. Right? Um, there's this whole discussion around the morality of A-B testing because A-B testing and our ability to just run these small tests, what will improve it, what will engage us more, we find all these things of how we can hack our mind essentially, how to get people addicted. Right? We are really good at automatically finding exploits for the human mind with A-B testing. A lot of this can be automated with machine learning that kind of looks at human traces and optimizes for some goal. Right? And I think there are lots of risks here where we need to be careful uh, what's ethical design. This is still all legal, right? Um, we're not talking about legal issues here. These are ethical issues. Um, there are actual safety consequences from this on mental health, right? So there's quite a bit of discussion how increased social media use correlates to teenage depression, right? Uh, Self-harm, um, all kinds of mental health issues. And there's a question of how much should a company like Facebook feel responsible for this, right? Um, they're not doing much these days. Um, if you're interested in a more positive view on this, what can be done? Uh, this is a recommendation. If you look into this specific aspect, this, uh, the Center of Humane Technology is a nonprofit organization that's interested in kind of looking at better patterns. How can we design this? There's, they have a podcast, they talk about these issues a lot. Um, so if this is something that you're interested in, this specific aspect of the problem, I can recommend this. By the way, I have tons of links to papers and different articles in this. Um, most of the pictures can be linked if you look at the slides. And then there are completely different issues. So we talked about safety, we talked about um, um, mental health and addiction. Um, there are lots of societal implications as well. There's a lot of discussion around kind of unemployment from automation, right? So we are certainly optimizing away a lot of service workers. Um, this is a simple example of ordering in a fast food restaurant that we um, have increasingly, we're optimizing away kind of insurance uh, 
networks. We are optimizing away truck drivers probably fairly soon, right? And this has implications on our society. You can think of machine learning or software engineering in general often as unemployment engineering, if you want to be negative about this. Um, there's a lot of discussion around what kind of jobs are we losing? What kind of new jobs are we gaining? Um, it's probably not the same amount. It's probably not for the same kind of people. Maybe it's good. Maybe we should address this. Um, I think more systemic approaches to address this are things like universal basic income, right? Where we should maybe think about we're automating something. We're not giving, not everybody should work in these jobs. Some automation is actually a very good thing. Maybe not everybody needs to work 40 hours a week. Um, but things to think about. There's also a lot of discussions around how machine learning and kind of the recommendations and uh, is causing kind of filter bubbles and kind of polarization, right? You only see content that you already agree with or you see primarily content uh, that will enrage you, right? So this is the thing that you're engaging with. So we're constantly enraged. Uh, we're constantly kind of polarizing more, destroying democracy. Uh, potentially, um, there's a lot of discussion around this as well. And then even further, also things that you have seen certainly, right? So how much should we automate weapons? How much surveillance? Should we have a ban on facial recognition? Um, a lot of these AI technologies are developed in countries with not the cleanest democracies. Um, we are sometimes exporting them to, uh, to countries with democracy deficits. Um, and even in this country, you can think about um, where are we using them, how are we using them, and so on, right? So there are lots of issues around this as well. Um, somebody brought, up, yeah, Chris brought up uh, credit worthiness, right? Here's an example uh, of somebody well known in this case, uh, complaining about the Apple card when it was introduced, uh, how it kind of uh, discriminated against his wife, um, kind of provided very different credit ratings um, um, here, and having no way to appeal, right, things like this. Um, Racial discrimination, kind of really ugly pictures, right? So there's misclassification. Um, uh, and into this kind of discrimination area, there's a lot of research and we'll talk more about this on the fairness. There's lots and lots of examples, right? Discrimination in hiring and college admissions and credit rating and insurance and policing and sentencing and advertisement and you have this actually results in a lot of problems and a lot of unequal outcomes, unequal opportunities, um, and it reinforces kind of bad patterns, it reinforces biases and so on, right? Uh, sometimes called technological redlining. So you, um, where previously there were maybe humans involved in not giving credits to certain minorities or neighborhoods, now you just have an algorithm of doing this and there's no way to appeal, for, appeal to that. So, as I said, this is a somewhat depressing lecture, right? Um, you have a lot of issues here um, that can potentially creep in. Safety issues, addiction, mental health, all kinds of societal consequences, discriminations, uh, social equity, and so on and so on. And I think there's lots of things to think about. The place where we can start, at least the discussion here, um, this is where, so we can talk about, we will talk about safety later. Um, a good place to t talk about that covers a lot of the things that we that I kind of pitched in the beginning is I think fairness. This is something that's also extremely popular in terms of kind of research as a research topic in the machine learning community. And I think as I talk about later, there's also quite a bit that software engineers can contribute here. So when we talk about Fairness, this is again kind of fuzzy, but people often focus on discrimination um, either in the legal sense or in an ethical sense, right? So um, there's a lot of things, uh, a lot of places where discrimination is illegal, and then a lot more places, obviously, where it's also unethical. Um, so in the US, 
there's lots of legislation over years uh, about what are protected classes, protected properties that you're not allowed to um, discriminate based on, right? So in terms of hiring, you should not evaluate race, you should not evaluate sex or religion. It should never be a reason for hiring or not hiring somebody. Um, if this would be the case and somebody can prove it, um, you are in legal problems, right? So there are actual penalties here. The problem is often proving this, but uh, in principle, there are laws in this case, and there are more specific laws about certain regulated domains, often domains that had long problems, lots past histories of discrimination. Um, so those are specifically under scrutiny. And if you automate anything in this domain, in, in addition to just being kind of fair out of an ethical responsibility, you also want to be uh, fair just to obey the law and to obey kind of steep penalties, right? But again, this is hopefully not the only reason. All right, we're coming back to this more when we're measuring things, but there are, again, a bunch of different notions of what is fair, right? So, a simple difference is to look at the difference between equality and equity, where equality is just you give people the same opportunity or the same support, right? So everybody gets the same chances, whereas equity is different people may need different support to get to the same outcomes, to have the same opportunities, right? Um, these are very different concepts and we may want to, we need to think about what do we want to achieve and how can we achieve this? And one more thing is just to address the barriers and remove those in place. Still with me? All right. In terms of um, discrimination, we typically um, distinguish two kinds of harms, harms of allocation and harms of representation. Um, Harms of allocation means that different people have different um, outcomes or, or different, um, we withhold opportunities or resources from them, right? Or uh, certain groups of people have poorer service quality, degraded user experience. So facial recognition algorithms, for example, usually perform worse for women than for men, and they perform way worse for black people than for uh, white people. Harms of representation uh, is around reinforcing uh, stereotypes, uh, subordinating along the lines of identity. Um, there are lots of classic examples here as well. For example, if you have a black sounding name, um, this is way more likely that Google will show you advertisement along the lines of, has this person been arrested? Right, so you can search for different names and different names show different forms of advertisement. You can click on the link and they will eventually you will figure out, no, they haven't been arrested, right? But just because the, so, the name sounds, seems to associate with a certain um, uh, demographic, certain advertisement is shown to some people, but not to others. And you can dig in deeper here. It's not necessarily that the matching algorithm is racist or that an advertiser has targeted this kind of population itself, it might just be an algorithm behind, and there's actually a lot of discussions behind this, um, that the algorithm is optimizing for a very benign goal here. It's optimizing for maximizing ad revenue, or we can show different ads to different people who are more likely to click on it. And this is just something that will automatically, something that the algorithm will learn by different ad pricing, by different tendencies to click on this, which might be based on previous stereotypes potentially and so on. Right? So it might pick up on existing bias and reinforce this. Um, so the two harms here again, allocation, giving different opportunities or different outcomes to different people and stereotyping harms of representation. I, I have something for you to discuss in a second, but. Um, so what can we do about this? Um, first of all, we should think about these things. 
And I think the, the main place to think about this is requirements engineering. Um, there are many other places as well, but I think if we want to think about fairness, we need to start at the beginning. We need to start thinking about system goals. We need to identify what are our fairness constraints. Some are legal constraints, some are ethical. We typically will need to talk to stakeholders and stakeholders from diverse backgrounds to identify what are their cons concerns about the system, right? What are the right fairness constraints or the kind of problems, the kind of risks for discrimination or fairness? Do we anticipate harms of representation or harms of allocation in the system? Analyze potential feedback loops. We talked about the world versus a machine. Um, kind of think about what can our system do? Uh, how can it affect the world? How can it be influenced by it? Um, and then typically we can't satisfy all stakeholders equally, um, but we need to find a compromise. We need to find a compromise that obeys the law, that hopefully considers ethical considerations, important societal considerations, and trades this off with, do we have a business case? But, and how, how well can the system do? Right? And then you set constraints, requirements, you think about um, mitigation strategies. So if something bad happens, how can you deal with it? Are you just saying, oh, it's the algorithm, I can't, can't do anything? Um, kind of having an incidence response plan and setting expectations, kind of a assurance uh, strategy. We'll talk more about a bunch of these later. I think why to care about fairness is hopefully obvious. And I hope you take away that it's not just about the first point here, obeying the law, right? So there are certain things where you definitely have to obey the law, but that should be kind of a minimum bar, right? So you want to be responsible, you want to be kind of ethical, on top of this, there's also lots of arguments that just by being fairer, you're reaching more, uh, more people, right? So you, uh, the product is actually usable for more people. It has a broader audience. Um, you might actually compete against others. You kind of being seen as a more ethical um, participant might actually be a useful PR strategy as well. So, it depends a little bit who you're talking to, right? So if you talk to a CEO who is aimed at profits, maybe you want to focus more on the obeying the law argument and maybe the PR strategy, but also better products, more people. But also a lot of people will be convinced by ethical um, arguments. All right, I want to give you a moment to, to think about this and apply this. Um, so we can do, let's start with one case and do another one if, if it's useful. Um, let's do college admissions again. And let's again do kind of um, a master program, the master program that you're in uh, potentially or were in. Um, so think about we want to automate kind of the review of applications, right? Filter people or rank them automatically. So what are possible harms of allocation or harms of representation that you could see here? Kind of allocation of resources, quality of service, stereotyping, um, over under representation, denigration. Um, what are things that you can think of? So I think, so Jake talks about, um, it may help recruiting top talent if they see our business as unfair. Um, so this is, I think, um, a reason why we should be fair, right? Um, but let's think about uh, fairness risks. What can happen, what happens if our algorithm is maybe not unfair, right? So what are the possible harms that we can uh, cause? Daniel? 
Uh, one could be representation, where if there's like a uh, worldwide bias, say that white males are better programmers, then the admittance thing might admit more white males and then more white males coming out receiving good education are ending up programmers. So it just kind of perpetuates this stereotype and in, in the world without adjusting uh, at all. Yep. Other things? Citron, can you explain this? It's so related to Daniel's point, which is if you give, so like if you've already identified through your algorithm that there's a set of students that are more likely to succeed, in order to optimize the chances of success, you give them more resources. Mm -hmm. And that, I guess, helps them succeed better, but then that just ends up exacerbating the difference between the, the I guess the, it m makes the difference of like, I guess, potential for success even greater between the two different groups of students. And I guess that's not, that's not equitable in the traditional sense. You wouldn't think of that as a good outcome. Yep. Does have it, anybody have a concrete example of what we might pick up on in the admissions that might actually be a sign of kind of a very privileged background, for example? I would think one would be uh, if their parents are alumni of the, of the university or um, just family background. Okay, yeah. Um, legacy admits. Yeah, like Daniel just mentioned, um, sports that require a lot of um, expense to maintain your participation in. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Chris mentions uh, an address, right? So if we, if we admit people based on the address where they're coming from, undergraduate college might give us a strong signal, but also might bias us uh, potentially. Standardized tests, um, right? So there's a lot of discussion these days around using GIEs or not using GIE scores because it kind of potentially measures much more how much time you have to study for it, how much money you have to tutor, right? Um, so this alone might bias kind of who does well on those tests and bias the demographics. Studying abroad is another good example, right? Especially if you do this without any scholarships. Um, community service, yep, yeah, um, potentially. Unpaid internships, yep, yeah, it goes all the same direction, right? Um, so there are a lot of these, these issues, right? Um, we might reinforce existing under uh, over representation or representation groups, right? We might pick up on signals that um, correlate potentially with a success, right? This is why the machine learning algorithm picks up on, but it's just reinforcing existing patterns. So it's not equitable. It's may be equal, right? It's considering kind of equal inputs, but probably not even that. Um, and it's not considering that we might want to give uh, more support to certain populations or, yeah. Vivek? Yeah, I have a simple question. Like, uh, do you consider the criteria from a university also as an ethical challenge in that sense? For example, let's say for uh, ISA, they only want programmers. Yeah. So essentially, uh, you are blocking the other population from joining the company. That's creating a little bit of bias. So is, is that also counted under ethical challenge that we're having? I think you always have this. You have some ethical consideration, but it's not obvious which one is a problem, right? So not every form of bias is immediately a problem. Um, Daniel, is this on this point or? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's pretty related. I was just gonna say like the, 
uh, the domain of this problem or, or the way it's phrased seems impossible to avoid bias because basically what you're saying is what what can I do to, to predict if a student is good mm -hmm. so there's nothing like I mean everybody's kind of unique so there's going to be a good student from most every background so if you're trying to generalize that I mean you're essentially just saying you're like productizing bias so, so what often happens is that for certain populations, we have more information. So if the student comes from a university that we know, we can make probably maybe much more accurate decisions about whether they will be successful, right? So um, whereas if this is a student from a local university in the south of Alabama, I don't know, right? Um, we may not know anybody there. We may kind of be skeptical about their grades. Uh, I mean, international students even more so, right? Um, so we just have a way less information about them and make maybe more noisy decisions and maybe we are risk averse and then just go with the students that have a clearer signal. Just wanna, this is I think a good uh, segue here to talk about that not all discrimination or all bias is harmful. Uh, technically, actually, um, bias and discrimination are technical terms in machine learning. There are lots of things, can't explain them all, but selection bias, reporting bias, bias of an estimator, those are all ter technical terms. Um, this is things you can measure and so on. Um, and discrimination in general is a technical term for classification, distinguishing between two different outcomes. The problem is unjustified or unjust differentiation, right? So making decisions based on things that are irrelevant, uh, either for practical purposes or for moral purposes, uh, or that are simply just unethical. Um, there are a couple of good examples here. So in admissions and in, um, in credit rating, we don't want to consider gender or race, right? So this is considered unethical, this is even illegal. In a medical diagnosis, this may actually matter a lot, right? So we don't want the same prediction of whether somebody has some medical condition based on kind of blood pressure or something like this or weight, independent of knowing their gender, right? So. Uh, in this graphic here, you see that the top diseases uh, or causes of death actually differ in kind of ranking between men and women. And there are certainly differences. And this is actually a big problem that we, again, that we study certain populations much better. We have a much better understanding of how we treat certain populations. Uh, Children is an obvious example where we often have very little information about how certain drugs interact with children, but there's lots of racial and gender bias also in medicine where we simply test on dominant populations or we test on vulnerable populations actually, um, right? They have the highest risk uh, when they are going through early trials. So to really understand what discrimination or fairness issues are, this is domain specific. Right, so if we want to go back here, we actually need to have a discussion at some point. We want to distinguish successful from unsuccessful students, right? Or students who are potentially successful. So we need to do some sort of discrimination we, in the technical sense, right? So we need to discriminate between successful and unsuccessful students, but we don't want to discriminate based on factors that should not matter. Right, so we don't want to favor students just because of their skin color or the zip code that they grew up in, right, or the prep school they could afford. Make sense? Any questions? Any discussions? So it seems that fairness is, fairness is kind of like we as a society have decided that there are a bunch of features that we will fix to be irrelevant. And then we apply this to basically all everything downstream. That's one way of thinking about this. We'll talk about that this will not help. So if you, if you, do, if you go that route, um, you, you can optimize for equality. 
right? So you're essentially saying here, you give everybody or you predict a box independent of their height because the height is kind of irrelevant or illegal or sensitive attribute. Um, so it really depends what you're, what you're optimizing for, right? So in some cases, that's exactly what you wanna do. In some cases, you want to achieve equity. Um, it depends a lot on what your algorithm does and what society, what's, what's societally acceptable, I guess, um, and appropriate. And that shifts over time, right? So we get our expectation toward what's fair, I think improves over time. So if you actually look at kind of bias and discrimination, uh, we get way more sensitive to this, uh, to issues um, that might have been completely acceptable 10, 20, 50 years ago, right? Or have been not acceptable, uh, accepted by society uh, or by the broad majority. And I think this is, this is again where I think requirements engineering actually plays a big role because what we need to do is we need to figure out what are our fairness requirements? How do we negotiate between kind of expectations of society, expectations of min minority and majority groups, profit expectations of our business and so on. And I don't think there's any single simple rule, right? This is, um, this is domain specific. We need to kind of think about this. We need to talk to people, we need to negotiate. And once we, once we kind of can characterize what the fairness requirement, the fairness goal is, I think then we can start thinking about how do we test this? How do we enforce this? How do we um, assure this? Daniel? Yeah, I was, I was just wondering if um, the sort of discrimination, if it's more lax if you're trying to kind of predict things in the past versus the future. So like, a future example is like, should we admit this person because they'll be successful? But in the past, like, if you're trying to predict if a random person uh, was arrested 10 years ago or something, then the discrimination is, it's still unfair, but it's factoring in the discriminations of the real world in the past. So it's... So what's the prediction in the past good for? I don't really know. <laughs> so, so I think most of the time you want to make a decision now, right? So mm -hmm. you, you want prediction as an input for decision. Um, you can do pure data science. So kind of explaining, kind of observing the world, observing correlations, right? Then you might just study past biases or things like this, what correlates in the past, uh -huh. right? Um, so th there are certainly scientific questions where you don't try to make a decision based on this, but I think essentially always when we implement a machine learning component in some software system, we want to make a decision. We want to make some judgment um, and have some outcomes. So it always essentially has future consequences. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, all right. Let's look a little bit at sources of, um, uh, of bias. And there are a couple that we can distinguish. Um, have you seen this example? So this is translating a text into Turkish and back. What's happening here and why? Either if you've seen this or if you can guess. Right, the, the pronoun is gender neutral in Turkish. So there's simply no information in the, in the lower bar, right, about the gender. The, the top translation is fine, right? So it just translate this, it gets rid of the gender. But by doing this, we have lost information. So this, uh, the Turkish text doesn't have gender so Google just infers gender, right? It needs to pick one for Google Translate here. And how do you think it picks the gender? 
What is the nurse female, the doctor male? Yeah, that's just what they've seen most frequently in training data, right? So in training data, nurses are mostly described as female or in the texts that they've seen, right? And um, doctors were mostly male. Um, so the, the model essentially picked up on data that it has seen, kind of reinforcing a bias that maybe shouldn't have been there in the first place. Right, but is there. So we can think about this and uh, we can break this down and people have done this. So I'm, I'm just taking here this characterization of five sources of bias. So the first one is um, historical bias. And the, the translation example fits into this. Um, this is actually interesting. So th there is a story that, um, and this is, again is one of those famous examples of biases. If you search for CEO on uh, Google image search, only male people would show up. And this is just because most CEOs in big companies are male, right? So it's kind of the historical bias that has gotten us there and it just reinforces this. Actually, these days, if you search for a CEO in a Google image search, you find a bunch of female characters and they often relate back, those are often stock photos or they kind of relate back to a discussion on bias in this context. Um, uh, DuckDuckGo still shows only male people on the first page or so. Um, so I suspect they have actually intervened in, in some way. So historical bias, the data reflects the past correctly, but it's not the intended outcome. Right, and you can see why people might get upset about this, but it correctly reflects uh, the current state of the art. Um, you might also have tainted examples, especially if you have labeled examples uh, that are labeled by humans, by human bias. Right? So attempts at automatic recruiting often led to revealing a lot of bias that was probably already there in humans, but Amazon, for example, tried to have an automatic CV kind of classification system and they completely scrapped this because they, they figured that it was super biased. They trained on a lot of data and it essentially just showed them how the data was biased, right? It was really biased against female applicants. Uh, if an applicant came from an all female college, it was essentially sorted out immediately. Um, things like this, right? So it would, even if you took out the names, it would pick up on, on a bunch of other things. Um, and this was there, <clears throat> again, similar to the CEO case and similar to the, to the Turkish example, because the data is just simply biased and this is human produced data, right? So some humans have produced this, some organizational societal structure have produced this, um, right? And we're reinforcing this. There's also skewed samples. Um, can somebody explain what this might be in kind of um, crime um, prediction kind of scenarios? I think we talked about this earlier in an example, right? So uh, predictive policing or predicting where crime will happen. What might it be a skewed sample? Yeah, white collar crime isn't tracked. Um, So certain forms of interactions may not be tracked, but that's potentially more the previous case, right? So if, if you have an interaction with the police and the police decides where to file a report and where it doesn't, that would be more tainted example. What could be a skewed sample? How might it be skewed? You might sample some parts way more than others. How would you maybe see crimes in certain neighborhoods way more than others without involving kind of the bias of the labeler of not reporting certain 
right, where patrolling happens essentially, right? So if you kind of go into certain neighborhoods, you patrol them way more heavily than others, you will see way more crime there just because you're testing more, right? So let's say there's like 10, 20% crime in every neighborhood, but you're testing much more in one neighborhood, you see much more in that neighborhood, right? So the sample is not uniform. You don't look for crime equally everywhere. So this is not the police officer once they see crime labeling this incorrectly, right? Which often, which might come on top of that, right? They, they might observe something and interpret this in different ways, but they just the places where they're searching for things uh, might be different. Right, and then um, on top of that, the entire discussion, what gets filed, right, what gets considered in these statistics and so on. Then um, another example is, especially if you do feature engineering, um, that you pick features that are more informative for certain populations than for others. So the example here is um, that you do performance in, uh, employee performance reviews, and you consider leave of absence as a feature in there. And leave of absence might be potentially reflecting performance for men differently than for women. Right? Um, or for people with health conditions differently than for people who just take the time off for uh, partying. Um, so there are certain features that are just more or less meaningless or very noisy for certain populations and they're very precise for other populations, right? And if you just use them uniformly, you will just treat different forms of people differently. And then sample size disparity. Um, does somebody know about the Shirley card? Have you seen this before? So this is a card that Kodak used, um, kind of the camera company, uh, for calibrating um, equipment, for color calibration. Um, and this card was used for many, many years of equipment, right? It shows a white woman. So the, this was a sample that was used primarily to calibrate things. And it caused that camera were calibrated for certain skin tones and was often producing very poor images for other skin tones. You could have calibrated for other skin tones, but people didn't because they didn't test for that, right? So they optimized for this card. They had a sample, they had a very skewed sample, or they had lots of examples of white women to uh, test on and very few of black. And so you can think of this, um, there, there are many examples of this um, where people obviously haven't tested this, right? So this is, um, or have tested this on only the majority population. This is an example of a racist skin uh, soap dispenser, right? That works for white people, but not for black people. Um, if you have tested this, it was probably 95% accurate or so on the people that you tested it, but you just had a skewed sample of the population, right? Um, the different groups were represented in different amounts of, of frequency. So this happens, this can happen quite easily in data sets, right? We talked about having separate data sets for different subpopulations. So this is a strategy to deal with this, but if you, this is also a reason why image recognition or face recognition algorithms work so much better for white males because we simply have used more training data on this. We have more labeled data on white males and on other skin colors and on female and, and so on. Okay. Okay. And finally, um, <clears throat> a common thing are proxies. So um, where even if you take out the features that you kind of don't want to discriminate on, right? So you take out race, you take, take out color, um, uh, uh, gender and so on, you still may discriminate because you may use features that are proxies for this, 
So if you, let's say you do credit rating um, or predict, no, uh, credit rating or recidivism and you explicitly don't consider race, but you consider the zip code, right? Kind of what are regions where many people default or what are regions that um, where, um, where a lot of crime is committed. This may make sense, right? Zip code may actually be a good feature for some of these activities like credit um, rating and so on, but they're often correlated with attributes that are protected, right? So if you look at the map here of uh, New York, you can see that different neighborhoods uh, have different population distributions and so if you use that information, it's correlating with protected attributes that you don't want to use, right? And you might up, end up discriminating indirectly without even realizing this. And then researchers come along years later and kind of say, oh, your algorithm is discriminatory. Um, this is kind of how the, uh, how the compass algorithm, the um, recidivism thing works, right? Um, People were claiming, they were looking at the algorithm from the outside, they were uh, claiming there were certain things that might correlate with race um, and that was used instead. Um, so let's go back. Um, let's think about, we want, to, we want to do this college admissions thing again, right? So we want to know, is a student likely to succeed? We have a bunch of features. Um, GPA, SAT, uh, GIE, race, gender, household income, and city, and so on. Um, what information or which of these biases can lead to kind of problems here? So let's maybe just go through them one by one. Um, can you think of an example of kind of a historical bias that might play into your machine learning classifier? I think we mentioned this earlier already, right? But um, so I can maybe. Um, I mean, succeed, um, the question is, what, what's the definition of succeed? Uh, let's say they're graduating successfully, they're not struggling in the program or dropping out, or they are having a good job afterward. Um, so CMU has a long story about kind of um, trying to be more inclusive with regard to gender in their undergraduate CS education. So they had a very small number of uh, women in, as undergraduate CS students in the women that were in the program didn't feel particularly welcome. Uh, it was kind of this boys club, right? So they would drop out more frequently. They didn't feel supported. Uh, they felt like outsiders. So there was kind of this self-fulfilling prophecy, right? They, they weren't supported, so they weren't successful. And if you just take that historical data, um, you, you get kind of a prediction algorithm that favors men and then you continue to have few women in the program, they probably still don't feel welcome, and you have this uh, kind of historical bias baked in. Right? So what they actually did was um, a redesign kind of the environment, redesign how they are looking for, um, how they're evaluating applications, for example, no longer requiring a prior programming experience, but instead providing introductory courses that are more inclusive and open to everybody. Um, uh, focusing on certain different aspects of undergraduate ex uh, education. Um, there's a, um, uh, there are a couple of good books about how CMU has changed its undergraduate CS education a lot and has achieved in the last couple of years actually gender bal balance in their undergraduate classes. Um, Kicking Ass in Computer Science is a good book uh, that describes a lot of these efforts over many years um, kind of to, to make this um, a more welcoming environment, and this was fairly successful. Um, what might be tainted examples? So where human labeler provided biased labels on training data. 
in the college admissions case. The definition of success may have been very biased, right? So Jake was asking about this. Um, maybe somebody thinks uh, success is only if you get hired by Google afterwards and people who go into kind of nonprofits or things like this are not successful, right? Um, you could easily encode something like this. You can also look at success only in terms of grades uh, in hard math classes or something like this and ignore applications, I don't know. Um, there's probably a bunch of these things. Um, skewed sample. In college applications where you only have, um, where you kind of have a skewed sample of training data that only, that doesn't really represent the truth. Maybe you have only admitted the MIT students in the past and they were kind of successful, right? But you kind of oversampled in a pool of successful students and have simply no data about all the other students. Anything else you can think of? Um, Suddenly can, also quiet. Um, we might have uh, data depending upon the uh, location from where the students have been have come into the program so we, we can already see for example msc uh, we can see the country wise ratio is totally different and the success ratio is going to differ on the basis of that mm -hmm. right so you may may only have observed students from countries with lots of applications or actually maybe lots of money for, for applying. Um, yeah. Uh, limited features, some things that are good measures for some students, potential success, but not for others. I think maybe maybe this is kind of where the GRE comes in for like students who had the opportunity to have time to study or, or you know dedicate more time to to doing well on the GRE it's uh, so probably from richer neighborhoods uh, GRE might be more indicative of success but from poorer neighborhoods uh, maybe less so because there was less time to study or less resource mm -hmm. to study from yeah so, so maybe for students who had actually a month to study for this, this is actually maybe a good measure that it discriminates against poorer students who don't. Um, sample size disparity, yeah, we may have way more students from, I don't know, India than students from um, Bangladesh or students from South Africa or um, Egypt. Um, and proxies. So let's say we explicitly don't consider gender, we don't consider race, we don't consider uh, country of origin. What might be proxies? You could argue a GIE is a proxy for ability to study and um, have a tutor, right? Um, the schools that they went to is potentially a proxy for gender or kind of class hierarchy or some, depends on the country. Um, what else do we have? Um, yeah, you probably don't want to use household income um, as a proxy, as, as an attribute. Uh, if you use the zip, uh, city or something, right, this could be again, uh, a substitute for the university where they studied um, or the opportunities that they have. Right, um, in the last couple of minutes, I want to pitch this. Um, this is one of the first books, Weapons of Math Destruction, um, that kind of talked about the problematic potential um, of 
kind of machine learning, self-fulfilling prophecies and so on, especially for high risk cases. It's a very readable book. Um, this was certainly my first entry, uh, contact with this topic uh, four years ago. Um, there are multiple books in this area and way more technical ones. This is very much not technical. This is kind of a policy discussion, but it has tons of examples of um, how machine learning algorithms or big data kind of drives unequal and unfair decisions in, um, in housing, in, um, in elections, in, uh, in incarceration, in um, credit rating, in advertising, and so on. So it has lots of examples, it's kind of a narrative. The main thing why I want to bring this up is, um, again, this is kind of how I started, with a few lines of code, right? We have a lot of power. We actually use algorithms, um, um, we use algorithms a lot for making automated decisions, right? So we might use predictive policing algorithms to figure out where to send police. And this is often actually something that we don't question. We might use a credit rating algorithm to figure out whether to give somebody credit and we don't question this. And there's no way to appeal this in most cases. There's actually a, a trend in, in recent years that um, you didn't get the outcome from a system that you wanted, but ah, well, it's the algorithm. Um, it's not our fault, right? So you kind of just say there's an opaque algorithm that to told me no, and there's nothing to be done about this. A lot of these algorithms are used in situations where it actually affects people's lives, right? And kind of high stakes decisions. Um, let me get back to this here. Um, so we often trust the alg algorithms to be objective. Actually often an, an argument for introducing them is that algorithms are more objective than the people that they're replacing, right? So the algorithm for the recidivism case is that we have an algorithm who's not biased by looking at the um, candidate, at the, at the um, parolee, right? At the person who committed the crime and is potentially released. We're not biased by just looking at them, by hearing them talk, um, but we're actually just using data facts that is neutral. The problem is we trust them to be objective and we don't have a way to question their predictions usually. These algorithms are often designed by and for the privileged and majority group, right? Often without really considering fairness. We're getting there, we're getting better. Fairness is a big issue these days, um, but still not, there, there's no requirement um, usually in the US uh, that these algorithms should only be used in their fair. They're usually black box, we can't, we can't question, uh, question them. Um, either because they use deep neural networks, which we don't understand, and often because they're trade secrets, which we don't uh, share. Predictions are based on correlations, not causations. They might be flawed. Um, the book actually has a couple of examples where they're based on flawed statistics uh, as well, right? So people have just built these algorithms. You can gain them. And then the problem is that we just trust these predictions they affect outcomes that are often biased. And by doing this, we are reinforcing patterns. So you often have biased training, datas, training data residing in a biased model. Because of this, you get biased outcomes. Because of this, you get biased telemetry. You use that for training again. So you're reinforcing kind of the bias in the system. Right? So Cathy O'Neill, the author, talks about this as big data codifies the past. Um, it does not invent the future. To kind of go into the future to make changes, you have to imagine something. You need to do something new. You need to actually do the requirements. You need to figure out how to design something explicitly. You can't just train on data, right? So you need to at least be very careful with the goal that you're optimizing for. So in predictive policing, the common example is that you have biased data because police was already biased and they patrol in certain neighborhoods more. They ticket people in those neighborhoods potentially more, right? Whereas white collar crime, they might let get away or 
white privilege, right? You stop somebody in a white neighborhood and let them get off with a warning, whereas you might ticket them in a different neighborhood. So you have kind of biased data to begin with. Then you do predictive policing. You train a model that's supposed to be neutral, right? It's not based on a person. So you might trust it, you don't question it. And it dispatches people, uh, patrols to certain neighborhoods. And then because police are more in those neighborhoods, you, you find more crime there. Or you might tell police, go into this neighborhood, but it's a low crime neighborhood. So if they see something, they might not consider this as suspicious or they might just warn somebody, right? And this reinforces a pattern. So we observe that actually predictive policing works because we go into those neighborhoods and we find more crime than in the competing neighborhoods. And by doing this, we find more crime in those neighborhoods, so we reinforce the algorithm, right? And this is a very common pattern, a very dangerous pattern that can happen in a lot of things. This happens with housing as well, where you kind of predict um, or make housing decisions. This can happen with insurance or credit card rating. You give somebody bad credit, they don't have opportunities. So of course they're defaulting on their credit, the little that they're getting, so they won't get opportunities in the future and so on, right? So this is, in all these cases, very dangerous that you might just encode the bias, right? So there's a lot of danger here if you're putting too much trust into algorithms for high stakes decisions. And this is, I think, where we're coming back to, to the beginning. Um, there are things here that are required by law and there are things that are ethical. We should probably push beyond the law, right? We can look in all the examples that I've shown in the beginning and think about what can we do about it? What should we do about it? How can we avoid? This is not intentional most of the time, right? Uh, we don't intend to build biased algorithms. We're just picking up on past biases, but how can we prevent this, right? And if we identify uh, certain criteria is how can we reduce it? How can we uh, eliminate it? And I think this is where I'm gonna uh, continue talking next time. We're going to talk a little bit about what we can do inside the model, certain um, fairness requirements, and then also what can we do around the model and in, in the design process. Um, and this typically starts already by acquiring the right data, uh, filtering the data, but then also deploying that user interface design and so on. All right. Any questions? Did it bring everybody down? I was just thinking kind of in your summary um, that a lot of the issues here might be related to um, poor weak backgrounds and statistics. Would you say that, um, you know, improving machine learning engineers' backgrounds and statistics would help a lot of these things too because they'd be more aware of the, the fallacies and the pitfalls? Yeah, I'm not sure how much this is the statistics part itself, um, but being aware of fallacies and being aware of what data you're collecting and what kind of safeguards you build in or how you're using predictions probably I would expect a lot is more kind of at the system level than the model level, but yeah. All right, I'm gonna stop the recording and then um, stick around for more questions.